we have done more than 200 series, more than 200 webinars now. And uh, we are very proud to say that when we started just before COVID, we weren't very sure whether we'll be able to justify this series. We're very fortunate. The series has gone through very successfully. We are already booked till the end of September, but in the last three years, we have had the privilege of hosting Nobel laureates, having a blend of Indian and foreign scholars, working with G20 and one of those 10 lectures that we did under one of those topics on um, new international economic order. We also worked on women empowerment, did six uh, webinars for our pending. We're not getting time slots for it. And we did six on climate and four are pending because we again are running short of slots. I'm also happy to mention that though we had thought we'll do one series, uh, in one webinar in a week, now we probably will have to do two next week, one dedicated to the budget and one dedicated in routine that we are doing on Kargil Vijay Divas. And next week again, after that, we'll have to one on employment issues. Good amount of discussion is taking place in the country on employment. And we are going to host uh, some of the authors of solid research on em employment. To name Professor Golder would be one of them. Uh, Surjit Bhalla would be still another. Ravi Srivastava would be still another. And this we are doing on August 6th. So we are getting jam packed and more than the Friday, we are now trying to fix during the week one or two more vendors. We have been very lucky that on contemporary economic issues, we have been delivering these webinars and getting the best minds in the country to come and speak on these webinars. We have started a series on why. Punjab deteriorated so badly in the last 20 years from number one position to I do not know we are 13 or 14 now on various parameters, but I'm looking at the state domestic product. Under this series, while we are doing five sessions dedicated to Punjab and each session having three to four speakers, we are now going to juxtapose it with five states which have done ultra best for themselves. For example, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Haryana. So we have five lectures granular on Punjab and five lectures on the different states within the country and how they have progressed so rapidly. A lesson for everybody to learn. A lesson for policymakers in Punjab to learn, a lesson for other state policymakers to learn where one can go wrong, when one goes wrong, what sort of things happen, and for Punjab to learn where can things be strengthened, and how come those states which are not in reckoning have suddenly risen to such heights. That's the purpose. Today is the third lecture in the series, and today we are focused on Punjab and its industry. We have already covered Punjab and MSMEs. And the first lecture in the series was Punjab and agriculture. All of them are on our website recordings. So you're welcome to see those recordings. Today we are covering Punjab and industry. On August 2, which is another Friday, we will be covering Punjab and services where we will cover various areas. And then we will be covering Punjab overall, where we'll talk about overall finances of Punjab. So today is the third in the series, and I would welcome you to ask questions or make observations while the presentations are over. To chair this session, we have specially invited Professor Kuldeep Kaur, Professor Kuldeep Kaur is a was a professor at the Punjab School of Economics, Kuru Dev University, Amritsar. Right now, 
she is still the professor there, but she has moved to the Ambedkar. She has extensive teaching and research experience in industrial economics and Indian economic problems. She has published nearly 100 articles, research articles in journals, 21 conference papers, 15 chapters in books, and she has also worked on 12 research projects. She is a life member of Indian Economic Association, Indian Society of Agriculture Economics, Indian Society of Labor Economics, and Indian Society of Regional Economics. In the last few years, she was chairing the Department of Economics, Department of Management, and Department of Social Sciences. That gives to her a 360 degree view of what is happening in India. And herself, she has worked a lot on industrial economics. So with this, I hand over the session to Professor Kuldeep Kaur to take the proceedings. Thank you, Professor Charan for honoring me to give this opportunity to be the part of this wonderful forum, which has organized more than 200 lectures. And particularly, I really appreciate your efforts to come at the micro level to have these seminars on Punjab economy, which is need of the hour for that purpose. And uh, two earlier uh, uh, seminars on Punjab economy were wonderful, and they are really uh, good by the wonderful speakers as well. Now, today, since we are having uh, uh, this third seminar in the series on Punjab economy, on Punjab industry, thereby one thing comes in my mind is that uh, the main industry of Punjab is agriculture, which I always say Punjab is agriculture, which provides raw material or which produces raw materials to produce or the semi-finished goods for agro-processing industry. Uh, which is a major sector of industrialization. And uh, probably the interlinkages between the agro-processing industry and industrialization of Punjab could have been uh, reaped and could have been much, much uh, useful or uh, proved to be very, very uh, helpful in increasing the industrialization of uh, Punjab. But this lack of this, uh, uh, like of this type of uh, interlinkages or reaping up of this interlinkages, I think is responsible for agriculture distress in Punjab. So uh, overall view of uh, Punjab industrial structure is this, that it is dominated by small scale or MSMEs, whereas the large scale industry constitutes less than 1% of the total industrial units of Punjab. This is a broad structure of Punjab's industrialization. And if I go for after this uh, latest figures given under, in the economic survey of Punjab, uh, I could see that there is more than 4 lakh small scale industrial units as compared to 1,057 1, large medium units only. See this comparison, which indicates that Punjab is dominated by small scale uh, industry itself. So during 2021, the number of small scale industrial units increased by 99,639 with employment being 29.07 lakh people. So in the same years, if I compare it with the large medium units, then the number of increased units was 467 only. There were new large medium units which were set up during this period with the employment being only 3,68,363 persons, something like that. So which shows the dominance of the small scale industry or the small medium enterprises in Punjab. Uh, again, and other figure shows us that if we look after Punjab's share of large scale manufacturing in GDP, it is 8.9%. And uh, as compared to the national average of 10.8%. Similarly, in the same sector has 51% of industrial value addition in Punjab as compared to the national average being 80%. And just a look at the sectoral growth rate and employment for 22-23, uh, 
the same scenario is clear to us that uh, as for the growth rate of agriculture sector in Punjab is concerned, it's 3.7 percent. Uh, whereas the share of employment in agriculture is 29 percent. On the other end, the share of employment of the industrial sector is 25.1 percent and the services sector as is the trend or the pattern at the all India level that is 45.9 percent. So, again, if I talk about the locational concentration of these small scale industrial units in the sector, I would say that uh, small scale sector and the large scale sectors are concentrated mainly in one city that is Chandigarh, sorry, that is Ludhiana, uh, followed by I can say Fatehgarh Sahib as well as uh, uh, Mohali. Uh, then overall scenario of Punjab's industrial sector, I will just be giving the overall view of this since I know there are the experts in the line to explain them in detail. Uh, so overall scenario of this that the Punjab's industrial sector has got a big jerk. The units, there were uh, uh, many, many processing units in Amritsar. All of those units have flown to uh, Surat uh, in Gujarat. Similarly, there was foundry units in Batala. They are no more in existence. Mandi Gwindagad has also suffered. Means these types of un, uh, units which were, uh, sorry, cities which were known for some specific industrialization, industrial units over there, they have been affected negatively, maybe due to LPG policies. Where the Chinese goods have eroded the competition. Other reason can be uh, is there rather that the industry flew to the neighboring states to either to HP or to JNK, that is the uh, border areas, because these hill states have been given the tax holidays by the central government, where are there are no tax concession to the Punjab uh, industrial sector thereby. Similarly, due to other concessions given to these states, the Punjab have suffered a jerk as far as this industrial sector is concerned. An other factor which comes in our mind is the free electricity given to the agricultural sector and uh, to the domestic consumers in Punjab. And uh, what happened is that since this uh, uh, free distribution is given to agriculture sector, so there are higher and the hefty tariffs, electricity tariffs at the industrial sector, which basically increases the cost of production. And also there are frequent power cuts because of the supply and demand mismatch of electricity, which has passed uh, negatively as far as uh, this type of infrastructure is concerned. Other one is even the water cess or the other sorts of charges are higher in the industrial sector as compared to the other sectors. And also there is uh, one problem which I consider is that is there is lack of uh, skilled manpower. There is a skill gap. I remember when I undertook one research project on measuring the skill gap uh, sanctioned to me by the Punjab government to measure the skill gap in the industrial sector uh, of Punjab, then I came to know that as for uh, uh, those uh, uh, own, uh, entrepreneurs were concerned, they considered that the uh, laborers or the workers or even the, uh, uh, the trained engineers which come to us are of no use to us because they lack the employability. Rather, we train our own uh, workers in our own way, then they prove to be more, more uh, uh, means useful for us. They are better trained rather than uh, uh, the, the training given in the in institutions, educational institutions or in the technical institutions. So thereby, uh, I came to know that the employability rate of this skill development centers is less than 1%. The, the graduates or the trainees which came out of these skill development centers were nowhere to be adjusted. So skilled uh, manpower non-availability is also an other cause uh, of uh, this flight of the industrial units to the other states or somewhere else or the loss of the industrial units from the Punjab economy. Uh, uh, this, these increased logistic costs Lack of ease of doing business has decreased and hence less incentives are there for the private investment. I will not go in detail for the figures of the private investment, but it's very, very visible that a private investment is lacking here in Punjab. 
so punjab has failed to reap the benefits of interlinkage is between agriculture and industry uh, what my last point is that i think so that the policy makers fail to think about the future of punjab uh, beyond agriculture they think that punjab is the agricultural state they should grow the food grains should ensure the food security that is why during the green revolution only its duty was to ensure uh, uh, the food grains or increase the production of food grains which we have suffered earlier it might have been uh, taken in the agriculture uh, uh, session on the agriculture sector of punjab there are lot many problems during this but uh, if i compare it that uh, the policy framers have never considered that uh, the punjab should also uh, grow in terms of industry so uh, here it is uh, that uh, i am going to uh, uh, invite the honored speakers turn bys to share their views to present their ideas regarding uh, as for the punjab's industrial uh, sector is concerned my first call is for dr anupma professor dr anupma upal she is from punjabi university patiala and she is she has 28 years of experience she has three books and number of articles and in journals she is awarded with best paper in labor economics on globalization and employment of women workers in unorganized manufacturing sector of india at the isle golden jubilee conference she is member of various bodies now without taking much time i should invite dr anupma upal to come forward for views on punjab industrialization please thank you professor kuldeep so uh, in the onset of my discussion i just uh, want to thank uh, uh, dr charan singh uh, for letting me uh, providing this uh, this platform and also Uh, i'm more thankful more than that i i am i'm i'm thankful that uh, he has started such a series of discussions on uh, on important issues of punjab economy and uh, also thankful that uh, he has brought uh, uh, this uh, the the academicians and the practitioners at the same platform and so that uh, if fruitful dis the, the the discussion can uh, could have taken place so without taking much of the time although professor kuldeep has uh, discussed about the main issues but uh, just uh, in order to uh, give my view point so i would be starting with some of the fundamentals of uh, punjab industry so let me share my screen with all of you so just a minute So is it visible? I uh, guess. Okay, so uh, it's a general general talk over the industrial growth in Punjab uh, about its opportunities and constraints. So as Professor Kuldeep has uh, has told us that uh, the the Punjab economy, the, the 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 industrial scene of Punjab economy that has been dominated by uh, the small scale industries, and although uh, the if we go by the, the the economic literature so we know that uh, the theory very clearly suggests that there is a uh, positive association of uh, economic growth with the growth of manufacturing units and uh, this relationship is uh, is really stronger in case of the large scale units and uh, it is true it is true for all the uh, all the industry for all the countries for example the low income countries the high income countries and the middle income countries of course the sub sector that uh, assumes it's higher share at a, at a very very high level of income um, in their in their in their economic history but punjab's uh, economy that has a peculiar uh, trajectory growth trajectory uh, because even after two decades of agriculture growth after commercialization of agriculture so uh, the, the surplus which has been generated which is assumed to be the prerequisite for industrialization of the economy so uh, 
and despite having all the uh, all the high values on the well-being indicators which are again preconditions of an industrial economy the industrial growth in punjab really did not uh, um, uh, took off so when um, as compared to if we just compare it with the, with other states we know uh, that uh, several states uh, the way they have uh, um, uh, they they have witnessed the, this growth of heavy industry uh, with help of the state support but uh, when punjab was really on the stage of on the verge of uh, this industrialization or we were thinking about establishment of the heavy industries so the liberalization took place despite having another other type of um, this disadvantages of having a disadvantages geographic location of having uh, you can say um, a long period of political turmoil so uh, the lpg was the, was also the the, the major reason um, that that means that behind this low uh, this development of industries in punjab because at that time uh, when the state support was most needed it began contracting or it began uh, or, or it, it was it was totally withdrawn in 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 several cases so uh, if we uh, just uh, try to have a uh, broader outlook which uh, professor kuldeep has already um, already charted out so we can have a broader look on on the economy uh, because you, we know that uh, this industry is composed of uh, three uh, major components one is manufacturing another is construction and electricity gas and water supply which uh, holds a very uh, very very uh, negligible share in overall industry industrial sector of the economy so when we look at uh, this uh, uh, this particular composition of uh, manufacturing sector and construction and industry uh, which is some total of these these these, these three sectors so in gstp so we can see that uh, the share of the industry so that is the, the that that has remained between 20 to 25% only uh, all through the last 20 years and uh, the manufacturing sector has more or less this uh, th this particular sector has more or less moved along the share industry which uh, which which uh, clearly shows that how this uh, the industrial sector is mainly composed or are mainly dominated uh, by this uh, manufacturing sector then uh, if we just look at the construction sector which is also an important component of uh, on, of this industrial sector so we can see that uh, the, this uh, construction sector after having a uh, decline up to 2016 it nearly stabilized but it never recovered back to its original position uh, particularly the position professor it anupama, the... professor anupama your powerpoint is not visible have you removed it no 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 so i think let me just re check it Vivek, can you see it um no, okay. sir, it disappeared. No, it's disappeared. Okay. Professor, you can put it alternatively if you quickly rush it to Vivek. Vivek can uh, run it from here. But okay, try so let me just can... if we would be having a problem the next time, so I, I would request Vivek to do it for me. Is it fine yes, now? We, yes, we can. Yes. Okay, so I was talking about uh, this construction sector. So uh, I, I said that uh, after uh, a uh, consistent decline up to 2016, it never recovered. Then um, when we look at but just focus at uh, the share of manufacturing and construction in the gross value addition of uh, industry total. Then uh, we see that uh, uh, this uh, the share of construction sector in total industry that has been consistently declining, and uh, that of the manufacturing sector that is uh, the, that is that that is increasing. So uh, this shows that the dominance and importance of manufacturing sector uh, in the industry or overall uh, this uh, secondary sector growth. When we go to the this overall economy, as that means uh, as a percentage of this uh, the, the growth of various components of uh, industry vis a vis uh, this GDP, so we uh, see that uh, this growth of GSTP is uh, uh, very much uh, aligned with the growth of manufacturing, um, especially after 2014. Um, it is also in alignment with the growth of uh, this uh, industrial sector. Um, at the national level between 2013-14 to 
uh, and uh, um, if I say that uh, this uh, GVA uh, growth of uh, that of the, of the, uh, at the national level that is growing at about 5.5 percent, and uh, the growth of industry in Punjab that is that was growing at 5.6 uh, percent level. And uh, so I have uh, so the, this is again that's uh, that's uh, this part of uh, that particular slide because I wouldn't be going quickly all three slides so that we can come. Uh, to the we, we, we can just focus upon uh, the case of the large scale industries. So this is for overall manufacturing. Then uh, this is a very interesting uh, table which I have taken from the Punjab Vision document 2047. So this particular uh, this particular table shows that uh, um, there is a change in uh, total change in uh, this uh, uh, gross value addition. Over a period of 1924 to uh, the, sorry 1994 to 2019, and uh, it shows that uh, the total change in value added per capita, which was to, uh, to the amount of uh, some 81,182. So out of it, that 15.5% has been contributed by the demographic component, while only 17%. You can say 10.6% by manufacturing and 6.5% uh, if I just, uh, for your convenience, if I just highlight it. So you can uh, just focus upon this particular portion. That is, uh, this hardly 17% of this gross value addition during the period of 1920, uh, 1994 to 2019 has been contributed by this uh, manufacturing sector and uh, other industry. And uh, and a major portion that is uh, about 66.5 percent that is being that has been contributed by the service sector. So this is a this is a clear case of hypertrophy. That means the service sector is growing out of proportion in absence of the production sector. That is uh, the in absence of the agriculture and allied sector and the manufacturing sector. And uh, it also shows a peculiar characteristics of the dependent development. For example, Professor Kuldeep was highlighting that uh, Punjab has assigned a role of providing food security. So that means the the its industrial sector was uh, is supposed to be deliberately uh, discouraged for for its uh, for, for fulfilling its role. So uh, we see that uh, this particular composition, this particular contribution of various sectors and a depressed contribution of manufacturing sector that happens only when the large scale industry is absent uh, from the process of industrialization in any economy. So that is the important point. That is why I have particularly taken this particular uh, table. And further, this vision document 2047, which we were supposing that it would be uh, talking about a faster industrial growth in future time period. So its projections shows that uh, uh, if the business goes as usual, that means if the industry, the proportion of the industrial growth that remains the same, then uh, actually the uh, this uh, contribution of industry would remain, remain almost the same and that of the services would grow at the cost of the agricultural sector only. For example, uh, this particular table, this shows that uh, uh, this, the, the growth rate of uh, manufacturing sector and uh, the indus overall industry would be 7.5% and uh, the services would be growing at 7.3% if we would be, we are aiming 6.5% uh, growth of the economy uh, up to 2047. That means this the, this vision document is not proposing a very very is not uh, showing us a very rosy picture or uh, raising the expectations about the industrial sector up to 2047. And uh, further uh, moving to just in order to weave the story to a meaningful way, I was just trying to show that uh, how the large scale industries are, uh, are are playing a role in industrialization process of the economy. Uh, Professor Kuldeep has rightly pointed out that uh, the share of the large and medium scale industries is very low uh, in the total industrial units. But I just want to point out another um, another scenario of this particular proportion or this particular structure of the industrial sector in the economy. Of course, we can say that uh, because Professor Kuldeep was talking about the latest data, so this particular table is up to 2019-20 only. So I would be adding the later values uh, later on. So in the number of units, 
in 2019-20, so that was 0.17% because about 99.83% of the units are uh, that of the small scale. And uh, but I want also want to highlight that with 0.17% of the units, this particular sector is is investing the 69% of overall uh, investment. And it is providing employment to the 12% of the industrial employees. And its production in, in, a, in, in overall, its overall share in industrial production is 52.41%. So in that case, we can, we can just uh, see the importance of this particular sector. We cannot say that the particular sector is not generating much of the employment because uh, as compared to its share in number of units, its employment in its share in overall industrial dual employment is much higher. It is about 12%. If we just juxtapose it with the uh, share of the SSI, we, we would be saying that uh, by having 99.83% of the units, they are providing employment only to the 88% of the industrial workers. So that is very important point uh, to be highlighted over here. And because the number of units are uh, very small, very, very uh, this uh, small for the large scale industries and very high for the small scale, uh, sorry, very, very low for the large scale industries and very uh, high for the small scale industry. So the, for meaningful analysis, we need to have uh, a per unit and uh, per unit figures. So instead of uh, focusing upon this particular slide, let me just quickly move to the next slide. So this particular slide, this shows that uh, the, 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 all the, these indicators in terms of the per unit values, the per unit output of the medium and large industries. Of course, a classification is, uh, is a bit overlapped because in the first sector, we also have the medium sector, and then we again represent the medium sector in the next category. But uh, this is how the data was available from the economic survey. So just in order to have a quick picture, we can say that the medium and large sector of the industries that is have producing something which is 10 times higher than the, uh, the, the per unit output of the MSMEs. And its per unit capital investment is much higher. Of course, its per unit employment is also very, very high. Of course, it is getting more and more labor capital intensive over a period of time since 1991. So its per unit employment is falling and that of the MSME that they are, that is be becoming more labor intensive, so uh, so it is becoming uh, so its per unit employment is increasing while that of the medium and large industries that is you know, that is coming down. Now, uh, uh, bringing uh, my focus upon the large scale industries only, so I would be using the ASI data. So using that ASI data, I have tried to classify. Uh, these these industries, which are which are which are registered in, in the, with the with the Factory Act, and uh, which are covered by the Annual Survey of Industries, I have divided them into the four broader categories: uh, the the firms, the the units or the sectors with negative growth, and the units with low growth, with medium growth, and high growth. And this uh, um, classification, you can say, is arbitrary, thinking that that uh, the uh, average growth rate uh, in, the, in, the, in the the nominal growth rate, so that being eight percent. So I have taken the, uh, the 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 low growth firms which have achieved a growth rate less than half of the overall growth rate of the economy, that is four percent. Then the medium, which is between four and eight percent, and the high growth uh, the, the factories which have uh, achieved a growth rate of greater than eight percent. So you can just have a quick look upon the type of uh, industries they are covering. So in low, in negative growth, we have mainly the post-harvest activities, the seed processing, this uh, repair of fabricated metals, machinery and equipment. While the low growth industries, they are having the textiles, leather, then medium growth, mainly beverages, paper and paper products. And within the high growth industries, we are having food products, wood products, um, this uh, wearing apparel and so on. Now, coming to the basic characteristics of uh, this large scale industries um, by their growth trajectories. So this particular uh, table, this shows that their share in operational factories. This shows uh, their share in invested capital in fuel consumed, share in output, net income and share in profits. If you just look at the high growth industries, which are having 52%, which is not a lesser proportion, 52% of our uh, factories about which the ASI provides data, they are they, they fall in high growth trajectory. So that means a growth which is sometimes, which is something uh, having a value 
higher than the average growth rate of the economy. So they have a higher share invested capital as compared to their relative share in number of operational units. They have a higher share in output. They have a relatively higher share in uh, profits. And the interestingly, they have a much lower share as compared to uh, their, uh, you can say, um, in case of fuel consumption. So their, their relative share in operational units is 52.2%, while in their uh, share in energy consumption is 42.43%. As compared to the medium growth industries, which are having a relatively higher share in fuel consumption, so is the case of these uh, low growth industries. It is only it is uh, it is lower only in case of the negative growth industries. So the negative growth industries are the industries they are having a lower share in energy consumption because uh, they are you know, they are they are winding up their operations and uh, they are having uh, they they are type of industries we have seen in the previous slide that they are of type of industries which are less energy consuming, but in case of the high growth industries, so this is very peculiar that uh, they are the in the, they are the units which are more energy efficient. So, uh, so by going through these slides, we are just trying to look at the the the, the, the factors which are contributing to the growth of any particular uh, type of industry. Then, uh, if we go to this uh, per unit values of uh, of invested capital, output, net value added, and profits. So it is very low and high growth units. Uh, if we can see that uh, you know, which have uh, higher than average values, uh, then the net value added and the net income that is very high for uh, these uh, low growth industries. So the net value added, which is a which is an indicator of productivity, and the net income that is highest in case of the low growth industries, which shows that these are the industries in which the, 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 the contribution is very high, the contribution to output is very high, the net productivity is very high, but the only thing is that their growth has actually veered out because uh, they, they have exhausted their, their, their increase in productivity growth. So these are the industries which may perhaps be using lower type of uh, this um, technology as compared to the high growth industries, they are still having a very high value of uh, this uh, net productivity as well as the net income and also of the profits of the net profits. So the low growth industries are also we, sh we should not be very pessimistic about uh, these low growth industries because their productivity is still very high beside, beside, despite having registered this uh, low growth of productivity. And uh, if we talk about the, this, uh, the constraints, uh, whether these constraints are the demand side constraints or the supply side constraints, so we know that the theory that, that generally uh, points towards the supply side constraints like shortage of infrastructure uh, and uh, mm, this uh, credit, et cetera, while most of the times uh, the demand side constraints are, are, are ignored. So it is also stated that uh, this uh, the, these demand side constraints are more a feature of a market economy because uh, in a market economy, when the uh, income inequality is increasing, the competition the, due, due to very high competition, uh, and uh, low income of uh, the um, of uh, uh, of this wage workers so the demand the, the, there is a, there is a demand side constraints and it is also stated generally stated that uh, the supply side constraints are more of a feature of a command economy because uh, uh, the, 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 the command economy would be providing fewer of the uh, infrastructure facilities and credit facilities it would be rationing out the things but we never think about the uh, the uh, so, uh, so we generally we generally say that uh, there are crowding of out effects of the public expenditure because as the public expenditure increases, this private expenditure that um, the, the, that that contracts. But we never think about the crowding out effects of low public expenditure or the contraction of the public expenditure because in case of the, in the heavy industry growth, it is required that it should be state supported at at uh, at least in the initial stages. And uh, if we just want to focus uh, on the demand side constraints, which are equally important in case of the Punjab economy. So I would like to refer this order books investment and the capacity utilization survey of RBI, uh, which is being conducted on 704 manufacturing units, which voluntarily take part in it. So this particular survey, uh, which is uh, popularly called Obika survey. So uh, this has highlighted a 
consistent fall in capacity utilization of Indian industries from 76% to 68% during the period of two, uh, after the period of 2018. So this, uh, of course, uh, we cannot identify which particular industry in that uh, particular survey belongs to the Punjab industry. So uh, this low capacity utilization, this can be uh, tracked by the data, this uh, uh, index of industrial production. So I have just tried to chart out the index of industrial production in case of the uh, Punjab industry using this ASI data. So it reflects if there is there is a there is a downfall or the, 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 uh, on this industrial production, it naturally uh, reflects that uh, uh, there is a low demand into the economy. So as as a result, the supplies are uh, are also coming down. Now the question is whether these uh, uh, the, these fluctuations. Of course, you can see that there is a sudden fall, and it it belongs to this uh, the the period the, this COVID time period, and after that uh, there there are regular oscillations in this particular curve, and uh, but the the the, the industrial the, this index of industrial production is increasing over period of time. So. In order to have the idea whether it is related with uh, the, the demand side constraints, whether these fluctuations are cyclical in nature or they are structural in nature, I just have tried to juxtapose them with the, the, this growth of the GSTP. So we can see that in this particular picture that uh, this uh, IIP growth is very much aligned with the growth of the GSTP in the state, especially for the declining part. So when the GSTP is declining, this particular portion of the industrial production, the, the IIP growth is also declining. And when it is increasing, so it increases along with that. So that means uh, we can see that uh, the problem is more of uh, the structural nature that, than that of the cyclical nature. And uh, if we look at the, the particular points which are being highlighted by the, that OBICUS survey, so we can see again that in case of the negative growth industries, the addition to stock as percentage of sales, that is 43.21% and major portion is because it's finished good that remains unsold. These are the industries which are having a negative stock of the raw materials because they are winding up their operations and they have a heavy stock. That means 74% of their finished good is, uh, is lying in their stocks. While in case of uh, this high growth industry, still we have a very um, high uh, this addition to the stock, but it is mainly on basis of the raw materials. So there is a, a thirty percent of it is that is the stock of raw materials. That means uh, we are optimistic about uh, the increase in production, about increase in sales. So this shows that uh, the, this particular sector, the large scale industry sector, that is. Uh, that is constrained by the demand. The low demand is leading to the negative growth and the high demand is leading to the high growth trajectory for these industries. And then uh, I have deliberately, of course, the credit should come in the category of the supply side constraints, but I have deliberately uh, taken it in the demand side constraints due to the my due to my next slide. So the uh, we can see that 69% of the investment that has been generated by the borrowings by the negative growth industries. Uh, and this proportion is 47% in case of high growth industries, but the per unit, uh, this average amount of loan that is uh, higher in case of the high growth industries than the uh, low growth industries. Why I have taken this particular slide in uh, the demand side constraints, it is because uh, due to the NPAs, the problem of NPAs, that this our banking industry or the banking sector has largely started uh, depending upon this, uh, the, the personal loans. So if we look at the percentage share in credit by the scheduled commercial banks, we can see that initially the share of the industry was very much high uh, as compared to the other sector that is agriculture and household sector. But lately, that particularly after 2020-21, the share of industry has come down not only below the personal sector, but also below the agriculture sector. So that means uh, the, the scheduled commercial banks are now working upon more on promoting the demand and rather than uh, this, uh, uh, this encouraging the supply side of these industries. And so the, the, the NPAs, they, they, are, they have been playing a great role behind that. Now coming to the supply side issues of um, infrastructure. 
So I would be just quickly going over going through these slides because these are the very general thing. So we often boast of uh, the robust infrastructure. We boast of the things that uh, uh, Punjab economy has that twice the average rail density. We boast about the 100% uh, road connectivity, availability of skilled labor force. But the uh, this uh, large in for the large scale industry, the infrastructure is a uh, big constraint. And uh, mm, various studies they have highlighted that uh, this is the this is the investment in uh, in infrastructure and r and d uh, which causes the uh, interstate differences in industrial performance infrastructure if there is in, there is not enough investment in infrastructure it also fails in retaining good talent and uh, good good human capital in itself so uh, this the, these infrastructure issues are very important the uninterrupted power supply, good roads, railroad, railroad connectivity. So these are the things which are the lifeline of the large scale industry. Practically also, we uh, when we talk about this uh, balanced growth theory by Harshman, he has also stated that uh, in an unequal economy, in an uh, unbalanced growth trajectory, the safer route is from creation of social overhead capital to that of the directly productive activities. That means the directly productive activities will automatically increase their investment only if there is a sufficient investment in uh, uh, this social overhead capital. So now uh, quickly moving over these uh, things, the, as uh, Professor Kuldeep has already highlighted that uh, uh, this uh, installed capacity that, that, that we have, we, we face power shortages. There is an, in, interestingly, if we would be looking at these lines, so we will be looking that uh, the requirements of the power and the total availability of the power, these lines just coincide with each other. But there is a huge difference between availability of power and the installed capacity, and this difference is widening over a period of time. Now, just commenting upon this particular alignment of uh, this availability of power and the power requirement, I would say that this is other way around. This is not that uh, the uh, our generation capacity is meeting the requirements. It is actually the our requirements are encouraged by. I would like to say, like to interpret it as as a way as the availability increases, the requirements of power would increase. If there is no power, then the industry won't be uh, won't, 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 We cannot imagine to start a particular unit if there is no availability of power. So it is not that we are meeting all the requirements. It is actually the adjustment of requirements according to the availability of power. And we see that uh, how uh, inefficient our uh, uh, electricity generation units are. And uh, now coming to this uh, annual per capita availability of electricity, I would be just be going quickly through it. So just want to point out uh, one particular thing that, uh, of course, uh, the industry is the largest consumer uh, during all the years. It has remained it, but it is only during the COVID year that it has it, its proportion has declined from uh, 544 to uh, 530 and uh, that of the this agriculture sector and domestic sector that has increased. But after COVID, the per capita consumption of, ind of uh, industry that has increased, but at the cost of domestic sector and agriculture sector only. So this is the general thing. And when we would be looking at the share of uh, this uh, industry in overall consumption, then actually this, uh, this share has declined. Of course, we would be having that uh, they are still having a higher uh, average values per unit values, but in overall share, this particular sector, this is this has declined from about 42% to 34%. That means the electricity is not uh, meeting the requirements of this particular of this growing sector of this particular sector. And uh, here I have taken the road length, and uh, the this uh, orange line, this is showing the railway net route. And this reminds me of the comments that was made by uh, Mr. Nagi during the session on MSMEs. He has talked about uh, um, this, uh, the, this rationalization of the freight rates and uh, the subsidization of the freight rates because uh, the Punjab industries are much uh, far off uh, from um, the ports. But I was looking in his light that he was talking about the freight rates, the concessions in freight rates. Of course, they are required, but we still have we are still stagnant in providing the railway routes to our industry, which is very much required. Of course, there is an increase in uh, this uh, road length, 
and uh, interestingly this increase in road land is uh, length is not due to the expenditure by the state uh, by, by the by the state government this is mainly due to the increase in national highways the only positive thing about it we can say that the decline in state highways that is much lower than the increase in national highways so registering an overall increase in road length into the economy now coming to the policy paths so i think my time is uh, just i'm surpassing that uh, particular uh, uh, allocation so this is the ease of doing business so i just want to say that uh, this uh, we we talk about ease of doing business when we talk when we take it in the policy section so we are actually meeting the market requirements but there are studies which are saying that uh, ease of doing business hardly had any significant impact on the additional yeah. inflows of uh, capital into any economy be it foreign capital or its capital by the domestic uh, uh, the, the domestic investors that means the problem lies elsewhere so despite boasting about the things that uh, uh, we are uh, we we are we are top rankers uh, in case of uh, this uh, ease of logistics we are top rankers in ease in case of the reform economic reforms still we are not able to invite much of the capital uh, from other sectors of the economy then uh, in order to have a, a particular policy so we need to look upon the industrial paradigms from 1860 so uh, we have shifted from steam power to the digital technology we have in organizational cases we have shifted from the managerial type of firms to the platform production and uh, from geographic look in, in case of geographic uh, scope we have shifted from local to national to multinational to global value chains so there is no one size fits all policy we are now currently in a digital technology uh, with a platform production with having a wide network of global value chains so our policies should also be strictly according to these paradigms so i think most of the policy most of the things uh, they will be better discussed by our practitioner which is uh, part of this uh, panel so he would be talking about how uh, this particularly if i would be saying that uh, he would be he would naturally be talking about the rationalization of gst and uh, uh, about the rationalization of the freight charges so my uh, point is more upon uh, this creating sector sector specific capabilities so of course we want more of uh, investment in infrastructure more of investment in r and d in uh, there should be greater availability of credit but when we say that there are the creating sector specific uh, capabilities we need to understand what is the normal path of structural change we need to choose which particular industry um, is to be selected first so uh, that there, there is actually a normal uh, path of uh, uh, structural change this normal path says that there are some sectors which would be having which would be creating more of the value addition in the initial part and then their their share would be declining for example in case of uh, food industries in case of the textiles in case of the wearing apparels so they they are the uh, they, they are the initial uh, sectors which would be taking off then uh, after some time it would be the chemical industry it can be the automotive or automotive industry it can be the machinery industry which would be having a permanent value addition by changing its own structure for example in chemical industry the structure would be changing from uh, from simple dyes to the pharmaceuticals similarly the automotive sector that would be changing its character if there is a greater great heterogeneity in it on basis of the technological changes it would uh, it would uh, its value addition can last for even for, for, for a long period of time so uh, just concluding it very quickly so i would be just highlighting that uh, in order to have a good policy for uh, industrialization of the large sector so uh, first of all we should be building sector specific uh, capabilities we need to uh, to choose those sectors which uh, about which we say that there can be uh, the maximum backward and forward linkages for example it is generally said that uh, if there is a there is an increase in uh, you know, this 1% increase in manufacturing job it would be leading to five times increase in uh, this the, these indirect jobs so that means we need to choose those sectors which would be having the maximum impact upon output in other sectors and also uh, on the employment in other sector so we need to build sector specific uh, capabilities we need to understand uh, their uh, binding constraints and work upon that then we need to create uh, this uh, the, 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 the shaping the markets by procurement by creating knowledge you know, about the about about the various networks to which uh, these type of uh, 
uh, this marketing channels that can be opened. Then uh, we need to the change industrial parameters. That means uh, with technical change, you know, we need to see that how the organizational structure, how the production sector structure of these industries of these units that changes uh, for the better growth of the economy. And with technology, we know that the sector specific um, these boundaries are being blurred. Then instead of uh, uh, this uh, focusing upon uh, this uh, classical uh, tr classical theory of uh, comparative advantage, we should focus upon the new uh, windows of opportunity, which uh, this uh, new technology and these new blue blood uh, boundaries of between sectors that would be bringing up. So I think uh, so on some of the points I may comment later on because uh, I fear that I may be eating out uh, um, this uh, that the time of other uh, speakers. So I finish over here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Anupama, for presenting an elaborate picture with the support of high volume of data, as well as some dismal future of the industrial sector of Punjab. Anyhow, may I request all the participants to keep their questions reserved for discussion, please, uh, because I'll be calling upon the next speaker, uh, 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 that is Dr. Minu, who, of course, incidentally happens to be our student. She is an uh, assistant professor in Department of Economics, Punjab University, Chandigarh. She has published various research papers. She is a member of many academic and administrative bodies. So uh, I think I should, uh, give a direct call to her and should uh, tell her that uh, she can restrict her talk to 20 to 25 minutes, please, because we are running short of time, please. Uh, Dr. Minu, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, uh, ma'am, because I feel so fortunate because my teacher <laughs> introducing me. Thank you so much. Uh, so I am not wasting much more time sharing my screen. Firstly, is it visible? No, not yet, Twitter. Not yet. Okay, okay. Let me. Is it visible now? Let me try. Uh, yes. Yes. Now we can Fine. see. Okay. So basically, because my area is, I work. Uh, in the area of international trade, most of my research it is in uh, uh, India's trade. But recently, some of uh, you know uh, because earlier it uh, earlier data regarding states' contribution in overall India's exports it was not available. But uh, after 2014-15, there was so much of uh, you know discussion on the contribution of India's states, uh, uh, India states exports in the con uh, in Indian total uh, sorry in total uh, exports of India. Then due to that, uh, I just developed the interest in uh, this area also that how states are contributing in our overall India's trade. So. Uh, as we all know that uh, international trade, it is a very, very important aspect, both for developed as well as developing country. And if we talk about India, before 1990, India was, uh, uh, you know, uh, following the policy of import substitution and after introduction of new economic policy, India followed the policy of export promotion because with the economic introduction of economic reforms, various other trade reforms were also introduced. So contribution of uh, uh, India's exports, if you see it in GDP, it is a very significant one and over the time it showed, uh, showed an increase also and played a major role uh, in overall development of uh, our economy also. We, uh, India is not only exporting agricultural uh, manufactured uh, exports, we are exporting agricultural exports, but higher share was of manufactured exports. Uh, right now also it is of manufactured exports. Uh, but between uh, uh, 2000, uh, uh, you know, seven, eight, and before few years before that, the share of manufactured exports it was earlier around 75 percent, but after that it declined, then around stabilized around 60 percent, and so. So it is very important to see that how in uh, uh, how different states are contributing 
and overall contribution. So I would be uh, uh, trying to convey or trying to share my views on uh, this particular area that how Punjab's exports are uh, contributing in overall India's exports. And uh, I'm just trying to move towards uh, now, central uh, overall trade and commerce, it is the responsibility of central government as per our Indian constitution, but uh, the areas of agriculture, industry and other local uh, like land and all these areas are related to states only. So, uh, it means that when if we have India level export policy, then it is not going to get the needs of all the states because every state is having, you know, different uh, type of uh, uh, regional uh, uh, availability of uh, agricultural crops as well as the raw material for their industry, right? So uh, here, if you see, uh, you know, recent uh, statement by IMF also, it highlighted that India would be contributing 16% to global growth rate in 2023 in, you know, going up in later years. So here again comes the importance of exports uh, right now. So, uh, when uh, uh, we uh, uh, see uh, about, uh, you know, contribution of India, uh, uh, contribution of various states in India's exports, Punjab's contribution is not, you know, at very higher rate because uh, it is uh, Maharashtra, Gujarat and other states which are in, you know, top five, this thing. But when we see the overall contribution of Punjab's exports, uh, in uh, India's exports, then we are not only contributing in overall agriculture and processed food exports, but also in manufactured exports. So, uh, as per economic survey of Punjab 2023 uh, uh, recent survey, so most of the established uh, units uh, of agro processing units, they uh, are in Punjab. Why? Because of agri higher agricultural productivity and production of the state as compared to other states. So, say around 7 to 8 percent total registered factories uh, of uh, food processing industry, they are in uh, Punjab and it is at fourth level as compared to if you take all the states collectively. And similarly, if you talk about manufacturing, uh, uh, this thing to manufacturing accounts for more than half of industrial uh, sectors uh, within Punjab, uh, jo, uh, have a GDP, a GSVA, that is the gross state uh, value added product, following by construction and other sectors. Now, uh, because I have uh, uh, worked on Punjab's agriculture and processed food exports also, and I mean, it is in uh, working uh, research or working paper, you can say, and also uh, manufacturing exports from Punjab. So a few um, aspects I will be sharing regarding uh, this only and uh, various data sources, which I have used for this, uh, just uh, like a beta specifically used for agricultural process food exports of Punjab, then statistical abstract of Punjab, RBA handbook of Indian economy, DGCIS specifically for exports and imports of overall uh, uh, India. CMI is providing for both state wise also and uh, uh, overall for India also. Now, uh, if if you see uh, to if we see the contribution of total exports of Punjab in India, the share uh, in the year 2007-8 it was 1.63 percent in overall India's exports, which uh, remains more than 1% or around 1.5% you can say but after 2016-17 it is it remained more than 1.5% except except uh, the year 22-23 so the and this year you can see in a graph also from 2007-8 to 2023-24 overall it remains at same rate and decline is not very much recorded here. Then, if we see district-wise share of Punjab uh, within uh, Punjab's exports, which district is contributing, you know, in total Punjab's export at higher level. So, uh, these are Ludhiana, Mohali, Jalandhar, Husharpur, Amritsar, and top the maximum exports as in earlier presentation also members talking 
is that Ludhiana is having maximum uh, industry. So its exports are also, so these last three years I have taken uh, because the data for district wise is available for these three years only from the source of DGCIS. So Ludhiana is contributing maximum, then Mohali and then Jalandhar. And if we see uh, top three districts of uh, uh, Punjab, that is Ludhiana, uh, these uh, Ludhiana, Mohali and Jalandhar, if uh, uh, we go through their exports, the types of exports, if we go through the types of exports here, so uh, here uh, on, uh, in, on in this slide, three years again I have taken, and these are the top 10 exports of uh, Ludhiana districts, which are almost all are manufactured one. And we know Ludhiana is uh, uh, known for manufactured industry. So manufactured exports maximum we have in top 10 exports. And I try to calculate that uh, uh, the top three uh, goods of uh, in every year, how they are contributing in these top 10 exports. And within total, uh, Ludhiana's exports. So these uh, every, uh, top three goods of these top ten uh, uh, goods of Ludhiana districts, it is contributing around fifteen point two nine percent in total Ludhiana's export. And if you see within these ten, though, it is around forty six percent. And if you go for the other two years, also 22, 23, 23, 24. So this contribution is almost, uh, uh, I mean, marginal decline is there, but uh, it is more than 40% for uh, top 10, uh, top three within top 10, and around 14 to 15% for uh, within overall Ludhiana's uh, exports. Similarly, the other district, Mohali, it is also uh, the same. Now, this is also in ascending order. These uh, export, top 10 exports are also in ascending order. So, here in case of Mohali, also all are uh, manufactured exports only. And uh, the contribution uh, within top 10 exports of top 3 exports, it is more than 50%. And uh, you can see in 2023-24, it is around 60%. It is 60%. And if you see uh, within total exports of Mohali, these top three, they are uh, this uh, contribution is uh, 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 for 21, 22, it was 27 percent, but in 23, 24, it increased to 31 percent. And similarly, the other district uh, next was Jalandhar. Now, here a little change was there. In earlier two districts, almost uh, all the categories were related to manufactured one or uh, manufactured exports the, uh, those were here we have processed food also or you can say agricultural and processed foods also like you can see basmati rice is a, it is appearing in top 3 in 23 24 early in earlier two years it was not there then sweet biscuit biscuits after top 3 sweet biscuit biscuits are there so these two basically are processed uh, items which are exported through uh, uh, Jalandhar. And its contribution, uh, overall contribution is uh, to, uh, the top three share in top 10 exports, if you see, it, it is more than 50%. And uh, similarly, top three uh, for to total Jalandhar's exports, it remains around, you know, between 23 to 25%. Now, these uh, three, uh, these figures, which I have worked out for these three districts, it is showing that maximum concentration uh, for top three uh, products, it is in uh, Ludhian, uh, sorry, uh, it is in case of uh, Mohali because it is around, you know, 31% uh, and then 60% for top, uh, three, top three within top 10 and overall. Uh, then next is about. Okay, now uh, I will be taking. Uh, these two categories, agriculture and processed food products exports and manufactured exports. Now, when uh, the growth, I just try to work out, uh, we have tried to work out this uh, growth for uh, Punjab's agriculture and processed food exports. And I, in first uh, column, you can see 
2021 year is not there in next column 2021 year it is included so basically idea was the year uh, 2021 was covid year or lockdown year you can say and we have included that so that to see that whether the growth is Hello, Dr. Mino. Dr. Mino, we can't hear you. Hello, Dr. Mino. Hello, Professor Charan. Yeah, I think she's connecting back. Okay, okay. So we should wait so for her. Some time must be a technical snag. We we'll wait for a minute. Otherwise, you can go to the next speaker. And when Mino comes, she was right in the middle of a very good presentation. Yes. Yeah, there she is. Fine. Am I audible? Yes, uh, Minu. Now you are audible. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. So I try to uh, work out to uh, work out updates on both agricultural and processed food uh, products exports and manufactured exports also from Punjab. So here I have. Uh, um, taken years uh, data for which it was available at that time. So 2007 to 2019-20 and then I have included COVID year 2021. So you can see here uh, the growth rate uh, declined, but it is, uh, you know, very less differences there. 4.9 overall. Uh, uh, 0.9% for 2007 uh, to 2019-20, whereas it is only, uh, it is 4% by including 20. Uh, categories for categories also, we try to work out some more than 10% uh, uh, growth. Those categories which are running were uh, uh, processed fruits, juice and nuts. Pulses, milk, uh, milled uh, products, alcoholic beverages, non basmati rice. These are the top three, uh, this thing, uh, which are recording more than 10%. Highest is recorded by alcoholic beverages, that is 37.5%. And uh, similarly, the categories are also there, which recorded between 5% to 10%, uh, which include basmati rice, fruits, and vegetable seeds. Other fresh fruits, uh, jaggery and confectionery, cereal preparations. And the same we work on. Also, categories of categories, is, you know, less as compared to uh, this previous uh, study period. Uh, period. Now, uh, if you see the structure of Punjab's agriculture and processed food exports, are, have uh, taken share of Punjab's agricultural processed food products exports in Punjab's I, exports. I, I, hi, Professor Minu. I can't see your slides. Are you displaying your slides? Uh, on my end. I can't. Maybe Vivek, can you see your slide? Yeah. Wait, no such slides. Your... Not. Is it visible now? No. Not we know, not yet. Oh. Not yet, no. 
ओके So, Mina, if there is any problem at your end, I think you should uh, go ahead. Okay. I'm not able to actually share. Okay, okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, from the agricultural process food exports, if we see the share of Punjab. Uh, products exports and uh, export. So from the in from 2007 to 23 24. So it is between 8.79% to 10.95%. Because it was more than uh, more than you know 20 for one year it was more than 20 and for few years it was 11% and then 17% it was also. Then share of Punjab's agricultural processed food exports and India's agricultural uh, processed food exports, it is uh, between 3.2% to 2.3, uh, uh, sorry, 2% to 3%. It remains 2% to 3% for whole of this study period. Then share of Punjab's total exports in India's total uh, export, it, uh, it, is, it was uh, uh, between 1 to 2% only. And share of Punjab's agricultural Food uh, products exports in Punjab's GSP. Uh, this year it was it or uh, it remains uh, less than one percent. For few years it was 0. 0.7 and uh, 0.9 percent also. Next, uh, uh, there are a certain cat, you know, dominant and increasing share uh, in Punjab's total exports uh, categories of this uh, processed food and. Uh, agriculture and processed food. So the leading categories having dominant and increasing share, uh, these were basmati rice, uh, basmati rice, cereal preparation. Now there are certain categories whose, uh, it's, whose share is declining during this time period. So the, these were uh, fruits, vegetable seeds, other fresh uh, vegetables, fresh onions, walnuts, processed vegetables, dairy products, natural honey, non basmati rice, and maize. These uh, were categories which were de uh, recording declining shares. And few categories are very having very low and constant uh, share only, uh, like ground nuts and other some other types of cereals. And uh, there are uh, five to six categories which are recording only. You know, just like ne negligible share only. Then uh, next uh, is about if you if we talk about position wise uh, top four concentrated categories uh, of agricultural processed food, uh, agriculture and processed food of Punjab during 2007-8 to 2021. So top four concentrated categories during all these years. These are Again, you know, basmati rice, cereal preparation, other honey, alcoholic beverage, non basmati rice. Uh, whereas non basmati rice was recording uh, negligent, uh, sorry, lagging share, but it was in top concentrated four categories during few of the years of this study period. Um, then uh, compositional shift. If you if we see overall um, uh, analysis of this uh, concentrated categories, there there was positional shift, compositional sorry shift from fresh vegetables, cereal preparation, non basmati rice to uh, maximum share. It is shifted to out of this natural honey, alcoholic beverages only. Uh, this uh, purpose was to 
be more specific or to have comparison of competitiveness also to have an idea of, of competitiveness of these products i try to apply repeat comparative advantage uh, um, index uh, on these commodities and i found that almost uh, all categories of agricultural processed food products exports of punjab they are recording more than one rca that means they are come and uh, if we see top four concentrated or top eight even concentrated because total categories uh, taken uh, were 23 so out of this top four concentrated if you if we take top four concentrated or top eight concentrated all these categories these record or they are competitive during this uh, time found to be competitive during this particular time period so uh, uh, concentrated uh, few commodities were like which were concentrated also but they were non competitive also and few commodities which were concentrated and competitive categories also so because uh, i have taken uh, earlier i have just talked about category top four concentrated categories so top four concentrated category all competitive but when we take top eight concentrated category there are few uh, commodities which are recording for few years uh, competitiveness was not there then uh, for manuf if we see Punjab manufactured products exports, no, in my e reports only because category wise data, uh, the overall data, sorry, for Punjab manufactured exports, it is available uh, uh, from the year 13 14 only. So I have taken that those years only from this source. So uh, compound annual growth rate for the year 2013 years 2013 for 22 23 it was recorded 4.84%. And if uh, uh, I take 2014 to 1920 only, it is 1.36. And I include 2020 also here, it is 1.4. So still by including that COVID year, this uh, uh, growth is positive only and there is very marginal difference uh, in that then uh, if uh, and then structure the structure of punjab manufactured exports share of punjab manufactured exports in punjab's total exports if we if if we take so it ranges between 66 percent to around uh, 80 85 percent during this time period and share of Punjab manufactured exports in Punjab's GSTP if we take so it is uh, it is ranging between five to eight percent during this time period share of Punjab's manufactured goods exports in India's manufactured goods exports so it remained uh, uh, below 2.5 percent for whole of the study period but ranges between 1.5 to 2. Point five for this whole of the study period then exports competitiveness worked out overall exports not for categories so it it again found that or for all the years 2013 14 to 23 uh, it was more than one that means manufactured exports uh, punjab manufactured exports in comparison to india of course so it to be more than uh, it found to be competitive because RCA was recorded at uh, it was greater than one here. Now, Niti Aayog also releases export EPA uh, export preparedness index for and till now we have three editions of this export preparedness index. Now, this export prepared index uh, basically uh, uses data driven effort actually. For, for core areas which are very important for export promotion at subnational level or state level. So all the states and union territories have taken and they have used around, uh, if we take all the indicators, they have used plus indicators to measure this index. And 
this index hell this index is uh, uh, it is you can say a guide for state governments to benchmark their regional performances according to the indicators taken by uh, this index so majorly policy business ecosystem export ecosystem and export performance these pillars are subdivided into some indicators and those indicators are subdivided into various sub indicators so when you uh, count all these uh, 58 some all the indicators when we count, count about this no these this, on the basis of this index hello yes, dr minu yes ma'am can you please come to the conclusions within 4 5 minutes please yeah yeah ma'am yeah, i'm trying to so uh, this if we check the scores of the cpi uh, export preparedness index of punjab uh, then over the uh, because it is divided into three categories underperforming overperforming and performing within the range so the relation for the year 20 for it is showing underperforming only on the last pillar that is export performance it was performing, uh, you know, uh, within the range uh, or overperforming. They are showing it is because export diversification uh, scores were very good for Punjab during 2021 edition. Then again, overall rank it was uh, increased from 18 to 8 for Punjab's uh, export preparedness index, and uh, most of the indicators were underperforming. But only export promotion policy indicator under policy pillar it was doing well twenty three it was not uh, introduced then in twenty twenty two edition all the uh, uh, pillars they were under the uh, category uh, which is performing within the and so this, if uh, uh, exports Punjab's exports index, then export preparedness, preparedness index time showing improvement. And if we go to the results uh, which I discussed about manufactured exports and over uh, Punjab, uh, Punjab's agriculture and processed food exports, it is also significant contribution of uh, uh, you know Punjab's exports in Indian uh, exports although overall ranking is uh, very uh, this thing uh, in, you know top 10 even but uh, as per the capacity of sports are performing well now all states because they have their own relevance, importance, and relevance uh, of it. Per focus and attention, it uh, it is definitely going to contribute more. And uh, uh, few things which are important to increase are uh, suggestions you can say, which are important. Exports. Its first thing is uh, providing effective and supportive institutional mechanism because in institutional framework uh, indicators, all uh, for all three editions of EPI report, we are performing very poorly. Then uh, we can identify focused commodities and the clusters also, which are uh, related to export related infrastructure. Then we can also specifically identify crop markets within India and abroad also. And uh, of course, competitive products can be identified as I have worked out competitiveness also on the, that basis. The other very important thing is about strengthening skill development as Professor Kuldeep uh, uh, Kaur also they are referring to this thing. So strengthening skill development efforts uh, tailored to the needs of manufacturing sector of our uh, state or you, we can identify district wise also where maximum export opportunities can be created to maintain manufacturing competitiveness and uh, collaboration of industry and its educational institutions it is very important to strengthen our skill developmental efforts here uh, so that various apprenticeship programs and curriculum development can be there so that we can maintain the also and 
continuous review and updation of industrial policy uh, aligning to global trade dynamics uh, so that we can give our manufactured exports also to uh, grow further and of course the processed food exports also because it is also part of manufacturing uh, somewhere. So uh, with this uh, I try to conclude and the last one more thing uh, recent foreign it was also one other point uh, regarding the focusing contribution that how states are contributing and developing various districts as exports hub uh, after identifying in which type of uh, product uh, they are going to so, uh, with this uh, I can say that we have can have bright future for our Punjab sports also thank you so much thank you dr mino for presenting the rosy picture of uh, punjab's <laughs> industrialization yeah. at the uh, through the exports at the disaggregated level thank you so much for giving the presentation uh, friends this was the treat from the researchers actually now we have a practical treat and we are waiting for it to uh, for uh, Sardar Dilpreet Singh Boparai, uh, who will be sharing his practical uh, experience with us on this aspect of industrialization. If I talk about uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sardar Dilpreet Singh Boparai's background, then I should say, say that uh, he is General Secretary of Mohali Industries Association and he specializes in manufacturing engine and tractor parts. He has played a pivotal role as General Secretary of MIA for, uh, for advocating the industry interest and growth in the manufacturing sector. Uh, Sardar uh, Dilpreet Singh Boparaj, we can't wo wait uh, to listen to you. So thereby, uh, my call is for you to share your experience at this forum with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sudeep Kaur Ji. Thank you, Professor Charan Singh Ji. And, uh, before me, I would uh, had the privilege of listening to the learned speakers, their exceptional presentation, their insights, and their uh, expertise has uh, done a very uh, good impact on my mind as well. And it will definitely help our listeners with what exactly the Punjab state of economy in terms of industry and other aspects is. So my role in terms of uh, as an industrial Association General Secretary, I would like to enlighten my audience that we as Punjab have seen the economies deteriorating from the position where Punjab used to be 30 years ago and where Punjab is today, which has been talked about by the speakers before me. Now, there are certain reasons why the Punjab economy has come to the present day scene where it is now standing. I would say we were very proudly telling the world about our textile industry, our bicycle industry, our leather industry, sports goods industry of Jalandhar, and obviously the metal industry of Batala. But today, the, all these industrial names which I have just taken, they all are now shifting their base outside Punjab for one reason or the other. One major reason which I feel and which I practically face and I do experience through our, my members of the association is the graph which is going down day by day in terms of ease of doing business in Punjab. We see that there are better incentives being offered by our neighboring states. There is availability of cheap land and labor in other states, whereas in we are landlocked and our land prices are tired of thing at the moment. At one point in time, the total cost of the project exceeds the cost of the land on which the project will be un undertaken. Then we have our dependency on the migrant, migrant labor. And now in the recent past, we have seen the very aggressive nature of the states like Bihar and Uttar Pradesh in their economic development where they are very aggressively inviting the industrialists from Punjab, Haryana, and other states to set up their plants in their states, which will definitely have a negative impact on the industry in Punjab, 
as the migrant laborers will be more than happy to work in their own homeland than to come here in Punjab and work under uh, Punjabis, as is the case with the, I might not want to touch on the law and order and other things. But definitely, we will be, we are facing the migrant labor crisis, as well as there is another crisis of skilled manpower, with which the Punjabis, who once used to be a very hardworking uh, community, is now allured by the overseas greener pastures there, and not willing to work here in Punjab, and all the ITIs, all the other skill development centers, we find only people from migrant labor families as their students there, and no Punjabis are trying to learn the skills which are essential for the growth of the industry as it is now heading towards automation and other advanced technologies. I would also like to highlight here that despite the shattered state of economy, I would say, the Punjab government over the years has been very liberal in distributing freebies to our hard working Punjabis. It is, the situation is so grim that the 20% of our state expenditure today is on power subsidy, which is 20,200 crore rupees, which has increased, increased from 15,000 to 17,000 and now to 20,000 in the last three years. And the contribution, when we talk about the Punjab, different sectors which are there impacting the contribution of GDP to the state of Punjab, agriculture and industry. Agriculture, as was earlier mentioned by Professor Kuldeep Kaurji, is 26% contribution of agriculture is there in the Punjab economy, whereas in Industry is contributing towards approximately 25%. And with this 25% contribution, the share we have in the budget allocation is surprisingly only 3,417 crore rupees, whereas in that for the agriculture, it is 13,784. This 1% gap in the contribution has significantly impacted the overall allocation of budget for the industrial. Uh, upliftment, which includes power subsidy, and of course, there is a 50 crore rupees as a fiscal incentive. I, to my other learned speakers, I would say, what would 20, uh, 50 crore rupees as fiscal incentive would do for the industry of Punjab, which is not, not even enough for one district, I would say. Then we have the capital expenditure. So when we when the Punjab state government will not invest in this capital expenditure items like the upgradation of the machinery, infrastructure, health facilities, education, and other things which will naturally attract the people to go and use those things, and then the revenue will come to the state, and then only the state will have surplus money to distribute among the other sectors apart from agriculture then only some uh, budget allocation would come for the industry. It is surprising that we out of the 10,355 crore rupees, which was for the budget allocated for capital expenditure in the year 2023-24, the government could only spend 6,406 crore rupees on its capital expenditure, thereby giving us lesser infrastructure facilities, which is distracting our businessmen here in Punjab, and th that is the reason why they are being lured to go into the other states. As a practical user of the state machinery and, and as an industrialist, I would like to highlight that it's been close to 10 years that the Chandigarh International Airport is just seeing one flight flying from here, that to only to Dubai, and there's no other further connection which is hindering the growth of the service sector, which was earlier being talked about, as it, the Haryana is growing at the pace of 9% year-on-year -year growth, whereas in Punjab is only able to manage 7% of the growth if we talk about year-on-year -year basis. Whereas in this is a very essential part because the industrial shift is going from manufacturing to the service industry and the IT industry is 
the future and it definitely needs the infrastructure push by the government, which is the need of the hour. Also, there is another distracting factor which I need to highlight here is the new addition of a stamp duty on any kind of loan if you take in the state of Punjab, be it a car loan, be it a home loan, be it any term loan or any machinery loan. The state government has now imposed a 0.25% stamp duty on all loans which will be taken by any person here in Punjab. This is also decreasing our competitiveness among other different states which are giving lucrative offers in terms of investment and land banks. I further would like to highlight that there needs to be a complete change in the policies of all departments where there is no synchronization. The fire NOCs, the Department of Factories Act, the NOCs for the pollution, these all are very uh, stringent uh, thing for our industries to get the clearances. And the industry now wants to be fully compliant because the day-to-day -day, uh, features of an industrialist, nobody wants to waste their time and energy doing the compliance. Everybody wants to be compliant. All our members want to get other factories compliant. But due to the policy matters, the industrialist is struggling to get the compliance from the uh, all required departments. So there is a major push for the government to sit together with all the departments and get a hands-on approach, not just a, a single window system in the name of the single window, but an actual single window system to attract invest investors' mind that there he can come and get his clearances and compliances in a very timely manner, which would definitely enhance his confidence of some industries who are here in Punjab for their expansion projects and definitely attracting new investments. So this is my experience so far that we are uh, doing uh, policy advocacy with the government on a uh, regular basis, but we are not seeing any uh, step forward from the government which we could say that we have some expectation that in the coming time that things would start moving faster. Sadly, that is not the story. But uh, that is the reason Punjabis who are still stuck here, that they don't want to leave their homeland to go to some other state. The Punjab industry is struggling, and they are looking forward from the Punjab government that if they could uh, listen to the grievances of the industry, which were also highlighted by many of the learned speakers before me. So I would like to conclude here with my insights, which I have just shared with you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sardar Buparai ji, for authenticizing our problems highlighted by the searches itself. I think we searchers are also closer to you for identifying such types of problems. Yes, yes. They, they actually tally with your problems, which you face practically thereby. And it's true that uh, we in Punjab are moving towards deindustrialization. Actually, yes. if this is the true word for that, deindustrialization, when the world is reaping the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution using AI, using internet, using robotics, and all that, cloud computing, and all that, we stand nowhere in Punjab or rather at India level, even. But the uh, situation is worse in Punjab. So, thereby. So, thank you. Uh, for coming at this forum and sharing your practical problems with us. Uh, I think now it's the time for the audience to be active. If there is any pointed query to all the three speakers, please, you are uh, most welcome over there. Yes, please. Let me share. Uh, I think the first question is by Mr. Vedant Singla, if I am right. The question is posed to Sardar Dilpreet ji in the form that is there is a form, forum for future entrepreneurs with MIA. That's the question actually. 
Yes, we do ha have a membership which is open for all the entrepreneurs, and we are uh, very much uh, open in helping our uh, entrepreneurs in terms of their uh, registrations if they are required for any uh, departments in uh, particular. And we do uh, also help in getting their uh, compliances and clearances. And we have a dedicated uh, office here in Mohali in the area phase seven, which would uh, be happy to cater to your requirements. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Vedant Singlaji, you have got the answer to your query, please. Is there any question, any query from this side, please? To any of the three speakers? Professor Kuldeep, can I ask one question? Sure, 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 Dr. Uh, Professor Charan. I think Sangeeta Shroff and Jaskaran also want to ask, but I wanted to ask this question to Bhupara IG. Uh, you said that you are making efforts uh, with the Punjab government. Are there uh, any initiatives from the central government also that can help you and are you approaching anybody there? And uh, secondly, uh, because you are a representative body, a trade body for the industry, uh, are there any are there any issues other than the ones which you mentioned? Which are the pull, uh, which are the push factor? You have broadly mentioned about the pull factors, but I was looking, are there any push factors which you think working in Punjab has not been very conducive, and that is why large industry is not coming there, or if it is coming, it's not sitting back or it's not staying back there. Any any such thing you found there, or you think what you mentioned, those are the key factors why they move to neighboring country, neighboring states. Uh, yes, the major factor is the incentives. Here, sadly, the state in, uh, is like that in Punjab. The Punjab Small Industries is Export Corporation, the PSIC, which is responsible for development of the industrial parks has not developed a single industrial park since 2016. So it, until and unless you identify a good 100 acre land chunk for the offer to the large industries to come and set up their industry here in Punjab, those guys will not come and they will not fight with the farmers for their uh, uh, getting the land approved and then the CLU and other things. It is the responsibility of the uh, Department of the state government, which is dedicated for the establishment of industrial parks, not only for the small industry, but also for the large industry. If they will offer them a good land chunk of 100 to 200 acres for the large industry to come up there, and then the ancillary units will be part of that uh, industrial park. That will uh, is something which will help the large industry to come and work closely with Punjab because the Punjab market is quite open as you see in the case of uh, Punjab Tractors Limited. That is such a huge success story in the name of Sabraj, Engine, Sabraj Tractors, which was owned by Mahindra and Mahindra. Now they have uh, made their uh, production four times from what they were at the time the, of their uh, uh, takeover back in uh, 10 years ago, I would say. And also when we talk about the policy matters, uh, with which the Mohali Industry Association takes up with the, uh, the state government, as well as when we talk about the center, we have some concerns with the uh, Department of MSME, and we are in regular uh, touch up with the uh, DFO office in Ludhiana, and we do have uh, certain uh, uh, communications going up with the Ministry of MSME at a regular basis. The, that is how we cater to the uh, demands and needs of our members. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sardar Dilpreet ji. Uh, Professor Chakran, I could not see the others so, who want to Yeah, Jaskaran, Jaskaran and Sangeeta Shroff, they have raised their hand. Yeah, hello. Yeah. yeah, I'm Sangeeta Shroff. 
Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, please, please go ahead, Professor. Uh, oh, this was just, yeah, hello. I'm Sangeeta Shroff. I'm a professor in Vaikun Mehta National Institute of Cooperative Management. Uh, so I just wanted to know about this Punjab exports. That is the speaker number two who spoke about Punjab. So obviously, agro processing is an important item of export foods, beverages, and biscuits. So I wanted to know to which countries do we export? Because other than exporting also the countries to which we export and the export price, uh, could that, would you shed any light on that? Which are the major countries where we are exporting, especially biscuits and fruits, fruit juice, etc. Dr. Meenu, would you like to yeah. respond? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, Sangeeta, ma'am, actually, uh, to go through uh, with the uh, go to APIDA again, because I have not analyzed this thing, this part, which you are asking, but yes, you can have your answer. You can go to the APIDA's website, and they are providing even, you know, region wise and country wise Punjab's exports of agriculture and processed food. So in a one or two click, you can have your answer. Actually, I have not analyzed this part, but you can have your answer from there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Sir. Okay. Hello. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my question is to Professor Anupma. Uh, Ma'am, uh, if we have to see the resolution of this uh, industrial deadlock in uh, of industrial growth in Punjab, when we see the overall picture of Indian economy, we see that Indian economy have missed the bus of industrial growth. As we see the classical economic uh, literature that uh, first of all agriculture grow and then industry and then, and then service sector. But Punjab has a very peculiar kind of case but at least we had uh, agricultural growth up to 19, uh, it, uh, 1980s. But after that, we are not able to cultivate that agricultural growth into industry. But now we have two cases. First was we have we had to set up large industries. Like after economic reforms, we have to set up large industries. That we didn't. But uh, but we largely rely on small scale industries. We had our own food processing minister, minister at central level. And as in the presentation of Professor Minu, she was saying that the Punjab's share in export food processing, it was just about of one or two percent. And in case of Punjab GDP, and that, that share is also is quite low. Then uh, what kind of specific uh, industries if we if i see uh, the case of food processing industries like if we see the in uh, at global value chain the product which are produced in in manufacturing industries specifically in large industries that may we create more value but in case of uh, if, we, if we see the food processing industries but punjab share is quite low what are the uh, as you have uh, specified that we should have some specific industries like in Punjab, the per capita capital invest, uh, investment, if we go by the recent economic survey, it is quite low. I think it is below from uh, all the major states in India. Then what kind of those uh, uh, specific industries which we should focus on that Punjab government can, can, uh, can try that uh, if uh, uh, they can do? Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Jaskaran. So I have tried to just uh, theorize uh, the things in my last slide, which I had to go through very quickly. So uh, I was just saying that, uh, yes, uh, the present industry scenario is dominated by the small scale industry. Then uh, I said that uh, there, there is a need to uh, be selective if uh, we do not have, let us say, we cannot say that we have a very low level of investment. We have very low level of uh, uh, this uh, uh, public investment in industrial sector. So the, if we have that, that type of uh, uh, 
you can say the limited resources, then we have to be very specific about which industry to develop. Then I gave some uh, some key points about that. But for example, uh, in my last slide, I was writing that. Uh, so we need to know what is the uh, uh, what what is the normal growth trajectory of what is the normal structural normal path of structural change within the industrial system. Then uh, by by that I mean to say that there are some industries which would be growing in the initial stage of industrialization. For for example, the small scale industry. I I highlighted the case of. Uh, this food and beverages, wearing apparels, and the, the textile industry, which would be having a higher value added in the initial point, then it's uh, that they, they reach their peak and they come down. Then there are certain industries which have a great heterogeneity uh, and have a great degree of transformation within themselves on basis of technology. So these industries, to my point of view, are the industries like chemicals, the industry like uh, automobiles. And uh, the, also the, the, the that which are based upon uh, uh, this machinery and equipment. So these are the industry which, uh, through their technological uh, changes over a period of time, they have the capacity, they have the potential to uh, to, to to sustain their value addition over a long period of time. So those are the industries which which we need to select, and then I try to theorize to say that uh, so so we we should be uh, we we should be selecting those industries which have uh, the highest number of the backward and forward linkages. So these industries do have those type of backward and forward linkages because with technical change they can uh, uh, they can provide employment to various other sectors. For example, if you are talking about the chemicals, which have uh, I highlighted that uh, they have shifted themselves. Uh, from uh, this traditional dyes to then uh, to, to to the to the pharmaceuticals. So see how they would be transferring for forming them over a period of time. They have and how they would be uh, having a you know, spillover effects of creating employment and uh, investment in other sectors of the economy. So uh, and uh, while selecting the, the uh, after selecting these type of units or these type of sectors, we need to know uh, that what are their binding constraints. So. If they are, there are binding constraints in shape of the availability of skilled workforce. If there are binding constraints in shape of the infrastructure or the credit availability, then we need to work upon those things. So this is how I try to theorize instead of naming one or other sector, because you know uh, there can be many new windows of opportunities over a period of time in each of the sector, even though it that, that sector is being classified as a low growth industry in the present scenario. So I think uh, I have answered your question. Hello, Mr. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, ma'am. Ma yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can uh, I add in this? Uh, can I add something here? Dr. Meenu, you want to say something? Uh, just, I just wanted to add. Uh, uh, sanction that he was saying that food processing very low share. It is of exports is very slow, but my point was. That when I found its competitiveness, it is maximum commodities which are concentrated, which are share, which are covering maximum share of Punjab's agriculture processed food exports. They all are mostly competitive for that taken time period. So we can identify like alcoholic beverages and natural honey. These are you know there is a shift in composition, and now we this composition. Uh, from uh, you know vegetable seeds and uh, processed vegetables it is shifted to natural honey uh, alcoholic beverages so identification is there actually uh, and um, as anupama ma'am also um, pointed out to this thing that there are various other factors so from export side uh, there are industries already where we are doing uh, you know well in in terms of exports i'm saying so and uh, processing Food processed food is a part of manufacturing also. Because if you see the definition of processed food, even uh, packaging, it is it is include uh, if uh, simple, uh, if you are taking uh, apples or, you know, mangoes and you are cleaning it, labeling it. This is also a part of process processed food and uh, so many uh, things like uh, making jams and sauces. These are included under manufacturing uh, activity only. So this is what I wanted to highlight. Okay, I think all the queries have been well taken up. And all. No, I think there are two questions. 
okay. uh, both from Kirpa Shankar. Kirpa Shankar ji, do you want to ask your own question? Well, uh, Professor Kuldeep, in the chat box, Kirpa Shankar ji asks a question, is there power subsidy to MSME units? Second, energy efficiency upgradation incentives to industries and renewable energy subsidy as solar. I don't know who would like to answer. Broadly, I think there is no such provision till date. I think uh, uh, Sardar Dilpreet will be the right person to tell about this. The exact position. Can we hear uh, from Sardar Dilpreet? Uh, the, uh, the incentive is as such for the uh, solar industry for the commercial set setup is not there. But definitely for the uh, residential, there is some subsidy provision. Uh, that is all uh, as per my knowledge as of now. I also am of the same opinion that there is no such subsidy provision as for, for the domestic consumers for solar uh, electricity. There are, there is provision of subsidy, but not for the industrial users as well. So. I tell you, means I'm getting a feeling having uh, not been in Punjab for very long. I'm having a feeling lots of incentives can be given to Punjab industry by the Punjab government itself. Yes, that's right. I'm really surprised how the industry is surviving so far. Because look at the incentives Karnataka gives to its industry, or Tamil Nadu gives it to it, or Haryana gives. Or I'm really surprised and listening to today Dilpreet ji spoke, and last Friday two people from different associations spoke, and every time I heard the association, I felt you know this is really the industry and MSME associations have been starved to some extent, or these industries have been starved. So, uh, Dilpreet ji, do you ever do a study, a comparative study of incentives given by the state governments in other states, and those are being given to you, or and no such research is attempted at your uh, trade bodies? We do not do any uh, detailed research or study on that, but we do know about the incentives which are being offered in the neighboring states. And particularly, as is the case, when we see the, the, the shift of industrialists going from Mandi Gobindgar and the, all of the pharma sector going to Bhakti, and we do see there is a uh, GST subsidy there, and then the, the land cost is definitely very much cheaper. And also to add up to the woes of the industry here in Punjab, we don't look for up for subsidies. We are saying that we should be just given ease of doing business. That our policies should be so straight that whatever compliance is needed, every industry is ready to get compliant. He should fill up his uh, forms and go to the re relevant department, and he should get his clearances within time. That is all the Punjabi industry needs. We, we, we are not dependent on Punjab industry is not dependent on the subsidies offered by the government. We are also uh, getting the heat of this free power, which is being distributed to the domestic consumers. Now the uh, Punjab government has come up with another uh, power quality meter, which is now being mandatory for uh, power intensive units. And the cost of the meter is close to 350,000 rupees. There's another burden on the uh, people who are uh, having power intensive units like the arc and induction furnaces. They are uh, having it mandatory by the PSTCL that you should install uh, on your own cost a power quality meter, which is uh, not costing less than 3.5 lakh rupees. So we are looking forward for uh, being less burdened by these kind of things. If, the, if you, as a department yourself, is not confident about the power. Uh, the quality of the power you are providing, then that is, should be on the PSPCL and not to the industrialist himself, that he should go and spend another uh, capex kind of a thing for himself. Because as we have mentioned earlier, Punjab has the, um, the major industries are from the micro and small enterprises, for which uh, the investments into these kind of things becomes a matter of concern. So I think there is a disadvantage as well. Being closer to border, there is no major investment taking place. 
from the private players and also not only state government but the, from the central government the hilly states uh, j and k and uh, hp are getting the tax holidays whereas there is no such provision uh, in punjab itself such type of incentives are not given to punjab uh, even by the central government so many many also, factors are there yeah, i'm really surprised what surprises like most is while you all are comparing with himachal and uh, jammu means why don't you think all your youth is going to chennai and hyderabad and bangalore so i think it's very obvious and logical that the industry associations should do a comparative study and say why is punjab youth going to uh, bangalore hyderabad and uh, chennai and do a comparative study of what is that these three states offer to their industry and that you are not getting for your industry means this is another problem i face I'm happy to note that punjab industry thinks they are so robust they don't need subsidy but do you think tamil nadu workers and karnataka intelligent industries they are not uh, they are not capable of handling their troubles everywhere no. i thought the government only sweetens the deal so that they are competitive and once they are competitive their exports go up they absorb the best minds from across the country and then they flourish so i now now that i'm speaking to you i feel there's lack of research on comparative incentives which industries which governments give to retain industry or to attract industry that's but my knowledge about industry industrial economics is very low but this is the impression i'm getting after listening today and uh, last friday yeah professor yeah, i would like to add here as you have rightly mentioning that the uh, punjabis are moving from punjab to tamil nadu hyderabad and other southern states the reason behind that is the punjabi youth is moving not the punjabi entrepreneur punjabi youth is moving to the southern hemisphere because of the presence of all these major big companies which are like auto manufacturers all the vehicle manufacturer plants are mostly in the central or the southern belt and for the uh, uh, when we talk about the competitiveness of the entrepreneurs and the industry or the msme uh, the down south is because with the presence of these bigger players they are the ones who will handhold their vendors their local industry and they will do their technological upliftment awareness and then they will definitely give a hand holding for them to increase their uh, quality parameters making them more competitive to uh, in the market and in india and internationally then there is another uh, thing we were talking about uh, uh, jammu and kashmir uh, having a bigger incentive and also the Uh, this, uh, our border area, state of Punjab, due to the center's uh, uh, ideology towards the border and closing it after the Pulwama attack and not opening it since uh, 2019, has only hampered the industry of the Punjab. Close to 50,000 people who were employed uh, for the uh, land uh, uh, trade with the uh, Pakistan. are now uh, uh, being made jobless we can in cash the central asia market through the pakistan route and that will, will definitely attract the bigger larger industries to come up punjab otherwise they think that we are if we go and set up a plant in punjab we will have to fight for the freight as the ports are far away but only with the opening of the pakistan uh, trade there will be a inside to the central asia trade which will open new avenues for the industry that is my opinion so i think sir now there is no query as such you yes uh, professor yes we have wonderful professor, session sure we had a wonderful session and yes. very very informative and i think very revealing I yes. learned so much from each one of the speakers, including you as the chair, yes. Professor Anupama. 
Dr. Meenu, young professor of yours, and Dilpreet Ji. And I have reached a conclusion, though I'm with my limited exposure to all of you, that a comparative study on industry needs to be undertaken. Yeah. Entrepreneurs go or not go is not the point. The youth is going. If the youth is going, then um, they are going because the entrepreneurs in those states have attracted them. And if the entrepreneurs of those states are being handled, handled by the large industry there, then we should have some large industry here and the same model should be replicated here. So I am not even thinking of opening Pakistan's borders and all that, all that. Within the existing infrastructure, we can do so much. So I think uh, the industries department in the government of Punjab uh, has to listen to what has happened today in the discussion. I'll be share the I'll be sharing the recording. I'm sure all of you, especially Dilpreet ji, you should be sharing with the government of Punjab and yes. saying that look, uh, when other states can hold, attract, retain, and ensure flourishing of their industry, why can't your state government do it? And once five large industries come to you. 50 MSMEs will flourish instantly and people will start, the youth will start staying within your country. Instead of saying, why is the youth going to Canada? I think we should start asking a question, why is youth going to Bangalore yeah. or Hyderabad or Chennai? That would be a better question to ask. This is what I feel after uh, doing a comparative, uh, means I've stayed in all these places and that's why I'm feeling so miserable today that uh, what has happened and it all happened and I did not even, and if I don't know who's been sort of policy maker in, in some way, I'm sure the others don't know. So a very big learning curve for me and I really want to thank each one of you and I'm sure the listeners and the ones whom will be sending the part, part the presentation uh, and the notings, they will all benefit. So I want to thank each one of you, uh, Professor Kuldeep, Professor uh, Minu, Professor uh, Anupama, Anupama ji, and uh, Dilpreet. Really want to thank you. Thank you. I have thank some you. important announcements to make. Uh, one is the budget is coming on um, 23rd of July, which is a Tuesday. We will have a special session under e group discussing the budget. This, of course, will be more analytical and more straightforward. These are this is not a TV channel, so there'll be no noise. We'll have eight speakers and experts on each of the sectors. Uh, and so I would welcome you all. And we will have the same time slot 4 to 5 30. After you have heard us. You are welcome to go and listen to the TV channels in the evening, but we will do a far more analytical um, study on the budget. Next Friday, we are celebrating Kargil Vijay Divas. We are going to have Ambassador Partha Sarthi, who was the ambassador to Pakistan in 99 when Kargil happened. We are going to have two army generals who did the study of what is happening in Kargil. And we are going to have one army colonel who was a commanding a unit in Kargil just before the operation happened. And we are going to have a professor from RIS who will be then giving us his viewpoint on um, the uh, Kargil Vijayativas. Next Friday, 4 to 5.30, we are having that. On August 6th, we are having a discussion on employment in our country. Professor Golder will be making a presentation and we'll have two more professors as discussants uh, in the employment story. And then on, um, on uh, July, today is July 19, uh, on July 26, we are going to have a, as I told you, the Cargill thing, on August 2, we are having Punjab and services. So therein we'll be discussing about health, education, and tourism, those aspects in the Punjab economy. 
Uh, I'm sure you have benefited from today's discussion. I'm sure you will take advantage of these uh, webinars which we are doing in the next two weeks. So I would invite each one of you personally to please come and participate, enrich these discussions, and also benefit from them. So once again, thanks to each one of you. And I'm sorry it has gone a little longer than our due time, but I'm sure as I didn't notice the time, you haven't not noticed the time. It was such a rich interaction between the learned speakers, between the industry and uh, the questions that were asked. So once again, thanks a lot. Have a great weekend. And we see you all on July 23, the budget day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Professor Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.